True love came to me one crisp late autumn morning, when the sky had lost the faded blue of the long hot summer, and taken on the deeper colour of winter yet to come. I discovered it in a hessian sack, floating down the bit of creek that ran around the back of the orphanage. I waded into the shallow stream, the water reaching to just below the hem of my khaki shorts, the current pulling at my skinny legs. The stream, already icy from the high mountains, was extra cold from the frosty morning, so that I inched and ouched my way towards the floating sack, grabbed hold of it and drew it back against the current to finally rest it on the bank of wet black pebbles. I untied the bag, no easy task I can tell you. The twine binding was knotted and slippery wet and my fingers near frozen. I peeped into the dark interior and, unable to see what it contained, upended it. To my surprise, out plopped six dead puppies. Flippity-flop, oh my god. With six dead dogs on my hand, I knew I was in big trouble. What if someone came upon me and there were these dead puppies lying at my feet? I hastily dropped each one back into the sack, ready to return it to the stream. But as I grabbed the last one, the smallest of them all, it seemed to quiver, and its mouth opened and gave a sort of gasp. So I gave it a bit of a squeeze and it vomited a jet of water. I squeezed it again and more water came out. One back leg started to jerk. I squeezed a third time and it must have been empty because nothing happened except that it started to breathe. Well, you can't just put a nearly dead puppy back into the sack and hope for the best, can you? So I took him beyond the shade of the overhanging mimosa and laid him down in a patch of sunlight. Then I quickly retied the bag and dragged it back into the stream and watched as the current caught it and it floated away around a rocky corner and was soon out of sight. I must say I was glad to see the last of it Five dead puppies lying at your feet is no way to start a morning. But then it struck me that a live puppy was going to be a lot more trouble than a dead one. How was a little kid in an orphanage where you are not allowed to have anything of your own going to look after a puppy? Suddenly, my life had become very complicated. I sat in the warm sun besides the puppy, stroking its pink tummy, which by now was pumping up and down, thirteen to the dozen, as it came truly alive, and started to get warm again. I was accustomed to getting into trouble, mostly because of my surname, Fitzsaxby. I was English. Well, that's what my name said. I was anyway, and I was in the deep north, high mountain country, Buda territory, where the English were hated because of what they had done in the Buda War. They had started the world's first concentration camps and filled them with Buddha women and children from the farms. Many came from these mountains. That wasn't the bad part. The reason they hated the British was because 27,000 of them died of dysentery and black water fever and other terrible and unsanitary things. In a way, it was understandable that they hated me for being English. You don't forget things like that when that happened to your own Oma so easily, do you? I picked up the still wet puppy and clasped him to my chest and he began to suck on my thumb and whimper. There was no doubt he was properly alive again and I had acquired a problem too big for a six-year-old boy's brain. All of a sudden it struck me. My friend Mattress, the pig boy, would know what to do. Mattress was my friend, even if he was a grown-up. If you're black, you get called boy, even if you're an old man. You can be a garden boy, kitchen boy, farm boy, house boy, or a pig boy like Mattress, because he looked after the orphanage pigs and also worked with the cows in the dairy. I can tell you, having a friend like him was good, because having friends in that place wasn't easy when you had an English name. Nobody wanted to be the friend of a Roynek, which is what they called you if you were English. It means redneck. One thing was for sure, the concentration camp business never went away, but was always pointing a finger at you. Roynek, you are evil, God is going to punish you, and you are going to hell, you hear? This is what happened to the Buddha. I know it's true because on Sundays, when we had to attend church, 
the preacher stood up in his long black robes with a little white starched bib under his chin. It must have been there to catch the spit when he got angry with the English, which is what he did every Sunday morning without fail. He got all worked up and thumped the pulpit and started going on and on. Soon he'd be red in the face and spit came flying out of his mouth and sprayed onto his beard that almost covered the entire bib. So after all that trouble to wear it, the bib wasn't any good at catching spit. At first I would get really frightened, me being the only Englishman in the congregation and him saying I was the devil's children. Not me personally, he didn't point out to me, but I guess it amounted to the same thing. All the other kids would turn and look at me, and guys on either side of me would give me a sharp dig in the ribs and whisper, Verdomde Roynek, damned redneck. But then I worked out a scenario that went like this. The preacher, who is in Afrikaans, is called a domini, had this big round head with jet black hair that was parted down the centre, and was plastered down on his head with grease so that it looked just like a shiny beetle's back. He also had ears that stuck out like small saucers on either side of his head. With the light coming from a window at the back of the pulpit, they'd glow. As he got more and more worked up over the English and the concentration camps, his ears looked like red lights glowing on the side of a beetle's back. His beady obsidian eyes that disappeared into bushy eyebrows, while the rest of his face was covered with that large black beard that came way down to the centre of his chest. So after we'd sung a few hymns, and Domini de Jaga arrived at the pulpit carrying a big Bible under his arm, with pieces of white paper sticking out to mark his places. I'd be ready. I'd sort of narrow my eyes and concentrate really hard on top part of his head, so that it became the big black beetle with large red ears and tiny, hard, shiny black eyes. The beetle would be busy chomping on a lush crop of black beard. Suddenly, he was no longer a huge, frightening preacher man condemning my kind to hell but instead became the great scarlet-eared, beard-chomping black beetle. After that, I wasn't frightened of him anymore. The Buddha War happened in the 1890s, when the English fought the Afrikaners because they wanted the gold that people all of a sudden were finding all over the place. The Buddha said no way, and the war went on for ages. The Buddha on horseback and commandos, and the British in regiments on foot. The Buddha would attack and could shoot the eye out of a potato at a thousand yards with their German Mauser rifles, while the British with their Lee Enfield rifles couldn't fire accurately at that distance, and besides, they were mostly lousy shots because they weren't born on the Feld. Then the Buddha would gallop away, and at night, every once in a while, they'd sneak back to their farms to get food and stuff so they could fight the enemy on the run for the next week or so. It was biltong mostly, which is dried meat cured in the sun, and you can live on it all week with a bit of flour or merely meal thrown in. What the Buddha did is guerrilla warfare, and the British didn't like it one bit. It was like chasing galloping shadows. Even though the English outnumbered the Buddha soldiers 14 to 1, they weren't winning the way they expected to. Then, being the British Empire and all that, so they came up with an evil plan called Scorched Earth Policy. They burnt down all the farms and put all the Buddha women and children into concentration camps where they died like flies. Anyway, that's what the Domini said happened, and that's why it was impossible for any Africana kids to be my friend. But Mattress didn't seem to mind and said that black people were accustomed to being hated by the Buddha and that I could be his friend if I wanted. He said both his grandfathers had fought the British and the Buddha, and if they hadn't had guns, the Zulu warriors would have beaten the pants off them, and nearly did anyway. So he didn't give a shit because they were both bastards, present company excluded. And Zulu Impi were, man for man, the best of the lot, and would march over the cliff and fall to their certain death to show how brave they were. Ah, Kleinbass, when they attacked, the earth trembled, and it was like thunder in the mountains. I didn't tell him I thought that marching over a cliff was a bit stupid, but it certainly showed they were brave. Now, I don't want you to think all Buddha were bad, because they are not. 
they can be very good and kind people. It's just they have a right to hate the English, and I just happen to be one. I don't know how it happened because I was an orphan, but there you go. It was an accident of birth and nobody could do anything about it. In an orphanage, there's a lot of unkindness going about, even for Africana kids. It's called discipline. It was just that I got a bit extra from the kids as well for having the name like Fitzsaxby. That couldn't be made to sound Afrikaans, no matter how you said it. They didn't like to say my surname, so they called me Futsek, which is an Afrikaans word that you yell at a strange dog if it comes up to you. You give it a kick and you say Futsek, and every dog knows the word and runs away. It means bugger off in dog language, only a bit worse. It's not a very nice thing to happen to a person's name, but it was another thing I couldn't do anything about. You'll probably think Mattress is a funny name for a person, but when you look at it through his eyes, there isn't a lot of difference between Matthew and Mattress. He liked the sound of Mattress better. When I told him a mattress is something people sleep on, he shook his head. Ah, Kleinbass, I'm not asleep on this thing. I am Zulu and must have a grass mat. Besides, mattress sounds much better than Matthew because it doesn't have the few sound in it. Anyway, that's what I thought, and besides, it was a whole lot better than Fortsek. Mattress sat on the low stone wall of the pigsty with his elbows on his knees and his chin cupped in his hands, and listened intently while I explained my problem to him in Zulu. Ah, Kleinbass, we have a big brig problem here. He dropped one hand to rest on his thigh and rubbed his chin. That dog is too small. I explained to him that there was bigger ones, but they were dead. No, it is too small to feed on its own. Look, its eyes are not yet open. It must have milk from the bitch. Where is she, eh? I shrugged and pointed to the higher part of the mountains. Up there. It came down river. That bitch, she must be on a farm upstream somewhere. Can we find this bitch? I asked hopefully. You could go and take a look. He thought for a moment. You found this dog in a sack? I nodded. And the sack was tied with string? I nodded again. Intentional murder. He pointed to the puppy cradled in my arms. If we find the bitch, the Buddha will murder the dog all over again. He didn't want those dogs. That's all very well, but what are we going to do? I said, shifting the responsibility onto Mattress, the way white people are allowed to do with black people any time they like. He didn't reply for a long time, and you could hear him thinking, Hey, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I could almost hear it going around and round his head, like things sometimes go in mine when I'm in deep shit. Footsick, you're in deep shit, man, one of the boys would say, when something went wrong in the dormitory, and I was going to be the one they were going to blame. And I didn't know why. I was guilty. Deep shit, deep shit, deep shit. The words would go round and round. I preferred just getting the shambok rather than having all the deep shit running around in my head. All of a sudden, Mattress's eyes lit up and he clapped his hands and laughed. The sow! Or put him with the black sow. She won't know the difference. Are you sure? I asked, uncertain. The big, big black sow wasn't completely black, but black and white, just like my new dog, and she weighed about 300 pounds. What if she rolled over all of a sudden and my little dog, which probably weighed less than a pound, was in the way? He couldn't even see to jump out of the way. The sow had twelve piglets that were two weeks old who never let up fighting over the ten available teats, and two left out would squeal like bilio, snuffling and pushing, carrying on a treat until they pushed someone out of the way and got a go. They had fat, round bums and curly tails, and already they were three times the size of my new dog. I can tell you it was for everyone for themselves in that pigsty, just like it was in the orphanage, and I didn't like his chances. Frankly, I didn't think much of the solution. How does a puppy that can't even see compete with twelve piglets fighting over ten teats? Are you sure? I asked again, holding the puppy up, who was now whimpering and with no doubt very hungry. Wouldn't he be squashed? Mattress thought for a moment. We'll give the dog a free go, he said at last. How do you mean? We'll take some piglets away from the cell, give her a chance on her own to get a good feed, till she's old enough to fight back. She? He clapped his hand and took a step closer and took my puppy by the tail and lifted its bum and hind legs. See? No snake. 
We got ourselves a bitch climb bus. I took a look for myself and Mattress was right. He was a she all right. All of a sudden, everything was going wrong. Even at six, I knew female dogs have babies and mongrel puppies at an orphanage wasn't possible. I'd just seen an example of what happened in the bottom of the sack. Even having a dog of my own wasn't going to be possible, but a bitch was totally out of the question. What will we call her? he asked. Can't. She's a bitch. She'll have babies, I said sadly. He nodded. Ah, woman. Always trouble, he agreed. He paused as if thinking. Shall I wring her neck? He brought his big black fists together, turned them in the opposite directions and made a sort of a cluck that sounded like a bone breaking. No, I yelled. My vehemence was so strong that my whole body trembled and my knees began to shake. Mattress laughingly placed his large hand on my shoulder to comfort me. I'm going to keep her, I said fiercely. My voice was close to a sob. She's mine forever. He didn't tell me that was impossible, which it was. He just said, in that case, you'll have to give her a name. Tinker, I said, not knowing why or where the name came from. It was something deep down from an unknown past, but plain as anything, sounding in my head like a stone shot from a caddy striking a tin can. Ah, Tinka, Mattress said approvingly, splitting her name in half and softening it, because you can't say hard, sharp words in the Zulu language. With her name out of the way, I became all business, names given identity, and now Tinka was definitely here to stay. Will she drink pig's milk, I asked. Soon see, climb bus. He swung his legs over the pigsty wall where a whole heap of grunting and sucking and squealing was going on. Pigs are not exactly silent types. Hey look, climb bus, he laughed and pointed to Tinka. Same like her. He said it in Zulu and what he meant was that the sow and the piglets were black and white. So was Tinka. The sow won't know the difference. She'd have to be pretty dumb, I thought to myself. Tinka was about the sixth of a size of the greedy piglets. It was obvious she stood no chance if she was going to have to compete for the sow's milk. The enormous sow lay on her side, in the muddy pigsty, her great belly heaving. Flies were buzzing around her eyes, flicking her ear to chase them away. Every few moments she'd give a deep grunt, but you couldn't tell if it was because she was happy or was simply putting up with the squabbling going on down below. Looking at it from her point of view, you had to wonder. Twelve piglets pushing each other aside to have a go? Their snouts contained right up into their foreheads. Each sucked like there was no tomorrow in an attempt to get as much scoff as they could before being bumped aside. It can't have all been that comfortable for her. Pigs don't muck about when it comes to food, that's for sure. I suppose it was the same at the orphanage. If you didn't cradle your plate within your arms and scoff it as fast as possible, the food on it soon disappeared into someone else's mouth. I keep calling it orphanage, and that sounds pathetic as if it was the olden times or something, whereas the time was 1939, with everyone saying there was going to be a war with the Germans, the English against the Germans, and you can guess who wanted to fight for the Germans. More about that later. The real name for the place was the boys' farm. It was in the country, about four miles out of a small town known as Willemskrans, which means William's Cliffs. This was because it was in the Libombo Mountains, and the town snuggled against the mountainside, and was slap bang up against these tall rocky cliffs that rose nearly a thousand feet upwards. People said that the climate and the flora and fauna at the top were different to those at the bottom. I wondered how this could be. Mattress said that the people who lived up there were a different tribe. One big cliff and all of a sudden everything changes. The trees, flowers, climate and the people. Maybe Tinker came from up top and she had come down the Litabo River. It was improbable because she'd have fallen down some mighty waterfalls. To do this and to still be alive would have been some sort of miracle. So I guess she came from some place not too high. Anyway... The boys' farm, which was on 20 acres, had its own gardens, chickens, pigs, 10 milking cows, and a small dairy for making butter. 
There were also two donkeys to pull the small hand plough used for tilling. There was talk of a second hand tractor, but it never came to anything. Lots of things never came to anything in that place. We all worked in the vegetable garden and the older boys chopped wood and milked the cows. What we did was usually considered kaffir work, but they decided that we'd all grow up to work on farms or as motor mechanics, timber cutters, lorry drivers, or maybe get an apprenticeship to be a carpenter or boiler maker in the mines. We had to learn early to do things around the place with our hands, as brains were not considered a high up commodity. It's funny when you don't belong to anyone, that the people responsible for looking after you just assume you're nobody. You're the government's children. They can do with you what they wish. So they train you to be the lowest common denominator, except of course for the blacks. You definitely can't be allowed to be as low as a black kaffir. So pigs are definitely not a white man's work. They're stinking creatures that live in the mud and their own shit that get squished up together to make fearful greeny black mud paste that stinks so much that you could have to hold your nose as you approach. Even an orphan boy couldn't be expected to work in the pigsty, which is why we had the pig boy. Although I must say, I got used to the pig smell and didn't mind it. Mattress said that if humans lay around in their own shit, they'd smell just as bad as the sow. Mattress moved over to the sow, the greenish-black stink mud squelching between his toes. He had very large feet because he was a very big man, and they were almost worn out as if they had been shoes they would have needed to be thrown out a long time ago. The soles of his feet were about an inch thick and were splayed out with deep cracks running down the sides. It was as if he walked on an old pair of really thick leather soles about an inch and a half wider than the top part of his foot. This calloused platform of hard, rough skin looked like it was glued to the under part of his feet. He had once explained that this had happened from his having been a herd boy in the mountain, and he was about my age. Kleinbass, I was a herd boy in the mountains of Zululand, and the small boys looked after the village goats. Goats like to be on the high slopes and on the rocks, and they've got you jumping from rock to rock and running and slipping and sliding down the razor-sharp shale. Soon you're bleeding and sore, and when you get back to limping to the kraal, at the night, the old men sitting under the marula trees laugh and say, Umfan, you are not a herd's boy's arsehole until the bleeding stops and the hard skin comes. Mattress laughed at the memory. Slowly, slowly, the soles of your feet grow hard. He pointed proudly to his feet. And then, when you get like this, you know you have beaten the mountains and the rock and the wicked white thorns and the shale that cuts like a knife. Mattress made me see that having feet like this could be a very big advantage in life because you didn't need boots and you could go anywhere you liked. As he walked over to the sow, she looked at him with a suspicious eye and grunted a warning a bit louder than usual, but otherwise didn't move. Pigs can be dangerous and a sow protecting her young is not to be trifled with. She must have known Mattress because she didn't seem to mind when he picked up four piglets by the tail, two in each hand and walked over and dumped them over the short stone wall into a vacant pigsty next door. Boy, you should have heard the squealing going on. This left two teats vacant. He turned, walked over to me, reached over the wall and took Tinker from me. The tiny sightless puppy seemed to disappear within his large hands. With each piglet having a teat to itself, the remaining piglets were going at it for hell and leather, and didn't even see Mattress placing Tinker next to a vacant teat. I waited anxiously as Tinker's nose bounced against the huge teat that was bigger than her nose. At first she didn't seem to know what to do with it, but Mattress held her against the pig's great pink teat and sort of rubbed her nose on it, and a small drop of yellowish milk came out. Tinker was on it like a shot. Her tiny mouth open, and I don't know how she got on that big so's teat into her mouth, but she did, and she hung on. Ay, the mighty one, Mattress exclaimed, clapping. She is a lioness, this one. She'll survive. <laughs>